Good morning, First Baptist. Let's all stand and worship together this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Your us. We thank you that out of your goodness, you sent forth your son, Jesus, to live among us, to take our sin upon himself, to die in our place, to be buried, and on the third day to come back to life so that we can be forgiven. We can stand before you justified because of what he's done. Lord God, we pray that in all things that we would magnify, that we would exalt, and that we would worship your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. We're so thankful that you're here today. Uh, If this is your first time to First Baptist Tribal, welcome. My name is Peyton Hill. I serve as pastor of this congregation, and we know that it can be hard to walk into a place you've never been and to sit around people you don't really know. And so we've got a gift for you, just a little way of of making you feel more comfortable, letting you know that we're thankful that you're here today. So after worship is over, I want to encourage you to go out into the back lobby on the right-hand side 
there will be some greeters there to answer any questions about our church that you may have, questions about following Jesus, but also to give you a gift just to say thanks for being here. Well, all throughout this summer, uh, week after week, we are going back over the scriptures that we have memorized during the year so that we can get a little refresher. And then once we get to the fall, uh, we will start out with some brand new scripture memory. So today, uh, we are going to review the scripture that we memorized in the month of May. So hopefully it'll jog our memories so that we continue to hide God's word in our hearts so that we don't sin against God. So I'm going to read it first by myself. Let the words of my my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 19, 14. Let's see. We're going to keep it on the screens. If you've got to cheat, that's okay. But let's see if you, can, if you can say it without cheating, okay? So I'll get you started. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Psalm 19, 14. Fantastic. Good job, guys. Uh, what, what a great way for us to hide God's word in our heart. Uh, we memorize five scriptures, one for each month of January through May. This summer, we're reviewing those scriptures and then starting back up on fall kickoff Sunday, August 14th. We'll start memorizing a whole new set of scriptures in the fall semester. Well, we are thankful that you're here and we recognize that this is a special weekend because tomorrow our nation celebrates Independence Day. Uh, it's an opportunity for us as a nation to be reminded of those incredible events back in July of 1776 in which the Declaration of Independence was put forth, eventually leading to uh, the war for our freedom and independence and all the rights and privileges that we get to celebrate and we get to participate in today. And so this morning, uh, we just want to say thank you. There's a whole litany of people in this room who have served our nation either currently or in the past in the U.S. military or currently or in the past as a police officer, a firefighter, or another first responder. So if you have served or are serving our country in the military or as any type of first responder, would you stand to your feet so that we can honor you and celebrate you and thank you this morning? So thankful to you for your service and for your families for the sacrifices that you have made on behalf of us, on behalf of our nation. This morning, I think it's appropriate that even as we celebrate and we praise God for the freedoms that we enjoy, that we spend some time in prayer. So would you bow your heads with me and let's spend some time in prayer to our creator God on behalf of our nation. Father, we acknowledge that you are the sovereign king over all. And your word tells us there is no authority that exists in heaven and on earth that does not come from you. So we know, we acknowledge that you ultimately rule and reign as the sovereign king over this nation and over our leaders. Father, we thank you for the independence, for the freedom, for the rights, for the privileges, for the justice that we enjoy in these United States. We thank you for those who have labored and served and even given their lives to gain and protect and defend our freedoms. Thank you for our leaders, for the servicemen and women, for the soldiers and first responders that you've granted and given to our nation. Thank you for their families who have served them as they faithfully serve us. We ask that in the days to come, that you will continue to grant our nation freedom to worship you according to your word. We pray that you would unite our nation so that we would talk with one another and not at one another or over one another. We pray for your protection to envelop our land and those who serve our, na our nation. We ask that you would grant wisdom to our leaders so that they would lead well in accordance with 1 Timothy 2. We pray on behalf of our president, Joe Biden. We ask, oh God, that you would give him health, give him a strong marriage, give him convictions to lead according to wisdom and according to the knowledge granted to him through his own conscience, but most importantly, through your word. God, we pray that you would change his heart, that you would bring him to genuine repentance and faith through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. 
We ask your blessings upon all members of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Would you give them wisdom and guide them in their decision-making processes? Would you overwhelm them with right convictions and give them a desire to seek the good and welfare of others above and beyond their own desires? We pray for the justices of the Supreme Court, especially in light of their recent courageous decisions. We pray that you would grant them safety. We pray that you would continue to strengthen them to uphold our nation's constitution. Father, we also ask your guidance and your wisdom to overwhelm our state leaders. Would you grant health and discernment to Governor Ivey and to all of our state senators and representatives and justices? We ask for blessings and favor upon our city's servant leaders, for Mayor Bill Gillespie and our city council members, our police officers and firefighters and first responders of all kinds, we ask that you would strengthen our city, unite us, move in us so that we would care deeply about one another and so that we would love our neighbors and seek to meet the needs of those around us. Father, we know that you are the giver of all good gifts. We know that it is a good gift that we live in this free nation. It is a good gift that we live in the state of Alabama. It is a good gift that we can call Prattville home. So help us to be good citizens who love our neighbors well, who seek the welfare of all. And may we be a people who do not waste the freedoms that have been given to us. May we be a people who use our freedoms to advance the gospel of your son, Jesus. May we use our rights to declare the message of the life death and resurrection of Christ so that sinners in our nation and beyond may be set free from their sin and brought into right relationship with you. We pray this in the name of Christ for the good of our nation. Amen. Amen. Well, we are thankful that today that we get to celebrate and praise God for those who serve our nation. We're grateful that we get to celebrate our independence. But more than anything, we acknowledge that as a Christian church, we are citizens of a greater kingdom. We have a greater allegiance to King Jesus. And so this morning, we want to lift high his name, his rule, his reign. So let's stand to our feet and let's worship and do just that. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried my sinful men, torn and beaten there, on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood stained mouth is the power of the cross It's me.
God, we just thank you so much for uh, sending your son to die on the cross for us. Thank you for loving us that much. And we just uh, thank you for this time of worship. I just ask you to bless Pastor Peyton as he speaks to us this morning and let us just give him the words to speak and, and just let us hear what he has to say and, and put it to heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much, Wes and Katie Zoe. You know, we're devoting our entire summer into a deep study of who God is. And even if you're not a Christian or if this is your very first time in a Christian church, whether you know it or not, you have thoughts and ideas and opinions about who God is. But as a Christian church who believes in the authority of God's word, our desire is to make sure that our thoughts and ideas and opinions about God are taken directly from the words that God has given to us in the Bible. Our God delights to make himself known and he has made himself known through the written word. And so this summer we're going to the written word to seek to find out what God has revealed to us about who he is. So far this summer, we spent all of our time looking at the so-called communicable attributes of God. Uh, these are the attributes of God that are true about him, but also ought to be true about all of humanity, and especially ought to be true about those of us who claim to know and follow his son, Jesus we talked about a lot of communicable attributes so far, and there are so many more that we could cover. But today, I want us to turn our attention to one of the communicable attributes that's often ignored. You know, we sing songs about the love of God. And we talk with, with tears in our eyes about the grace of God. And we, when we share the gospel with our neighbors and friends, we boldly declare the mercy and forgiveness of God. We encourage one another in times of grief by reminding each other of the goodness of God. We stand in awe at the holiness of God, but rarely, if ever, do we exalt in the justice of God. And so this morning, I want us to spend our time together doing just that, rejoicing in the fact that our God is just. So let me encourage you to open up your Bible to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're simply going to look at one brief verse of scripture and allow that to be the foundation in which we look at our God, the lens through which we gaze into the justice of God. Deuteronomy chapter 32, let me invite you to stand to your feet as we honor the reading of our sovereign God's perfect and errant word. Verse four, Moses writes this as he was carried along by the spirit. The rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. This is God's word. Let's go to him in prayer for help. Almighty God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in the written word. Instead of leaving us in the dark about who you are, we thank you that you have made yourself known. And so now as we come to your holy scripture, we pray for the help of your spirit Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Spirit, open our eyes so that we see the glory and majesty of the triune God revealed in the face of Jesus. Spirit, open our ears so that we hear the voice of Christ calling out from this passage. Spirit, open our hearts so that we believe that this is your perfect word for us, but also so that we would worship and walk in obedience according to this perfect word. We pray this, we ask this for the glory of Christ, for the good of our church, and for the spread of the gospel among all nations. Amen, amen. You can have a seat. Most Americans will celebrate Independence Day tomorrow by grilling some meats and maybe even lighting some fireworks. It's a special day because it's the day in which we as a nation gather together to remember that on July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was adopted by the Continental Congress. 
And if you ever take time to read the declaration, you'll find out that it's not a very long document. In fact, it only takes a matter of minutes to read it out loud. And if you ever do read it, you'll find that within that document, not once, not twice, but three times appears the word justice. Then just over a declaration or just over a decade after the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution was put forth and ratified, and it begins, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. Then many years later, in 1942, Congress finally ratified the Pledge of Allegiance and officially recognized it as the Pledge for these United States. And the Pledge of Allegiance that we learned when we were little boys and little girls ends with a phrase, with liberty and justice for all. Justice is a word that is often used, especially in the founding documents of our nation. But what does it mean? justice. And what does it mean for our God, the God of the Bible, to be just? When Moses was 120 years old, he had faithfully led the people of Israel through the wilderness for a matter of decades, and now they were on the cusp. They were prepared to cross over the Jordan River and into the land that God had promised them. But Moses was preparing to die. And so before he died, he was to pass the torch of leadership down to his protege, Joshua. And Joshua would be the one to lead the Hebrews out of the wilderness, across the Jordan River, and into the land of promise. But before Moses died, and before he passed the torch of leadership, Moses sang a song. What did Moses sing in his song? Well, we find it in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, verse 4. Moses sings as a finality to all of his teaching, to all of his ministry. What does he want to highlight about who God is? He says, the rock, our God, his work is perfect. For his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, meaning our God does not change, he keeps his promises, and our God does not participate in sin, just and upright as he. Old Moses, on his deathbed, could have said anything that he wanted, but what did he choose to highlight? about God, that our God is just and that his ways are justice. What do we mean when we talk about the justice of God? Well, it's important to know that in the English, we often use two terms, the term righteousness and the term justice. In your version of the Bible, regardless of what version it is, as long as it's written in English, sometimes you'll read the word justice and sometimes you'll read the word righteousness. But in the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, the word that we translate justice or righteousness is actually taken from the same root. So in the Bible, when you're speaking about justice, you're speaking about righteousness. And in the Bible, when you're speaking about righteousness, you're speaking about justice. So what does it mean for our God to be righteous, for our God to be just? Well, first, I want to show you that to know God is just is to know that God determines what is right. When we say that God is just, what we're saying is, is that God always knows what is right and God always does what is right because God is the one that determines what is right. That's why Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, Moses sings a song about our rock, our God, his ways being perfect, his ways being just, his ways being right. And with him at the end of verse 4, he says that our God is just right. Our Our God is just. Our God is upright. Moses wants to highlight the fact that our God is morally excellent as creator Our God gets to determine what is right, and our God gets to determine what is wrong. He doesn't simply set a standard. He himself 
is the standard. And this was the problem with Adam and Eve in the garden. Because in the garden, our just God told Adam and Eve that they could freely eat of any of the fruits of the garden. Our just God could enjoy all that the garden offers, but there was one tree and the fruit from one tree that they were not to eat of, and it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But rather than listening to God and allowing God to determine right from wrong, Adam and Eve chose to take and eat of the forbidden fruit from the forbidden tree. And the Bible says in that moment, their eyes were open. This doesn't mean that for the first time they experienced the difference between good and evil. They already knew that. They knew that it was good to listen and obey to God and it was wrong, evil, unjust for them to ignore God. But for the first time eating the forbidden fruit, they experienced what it was like to participate in sin and for the first time to understand what it means to be on the opposite side of a just, holy, righteous God. And so because our God is just, he removed them from the garden. Why can our God do that? Because God, as creator, gets to establish right from wrong, good from evil, what is a sin and what is not a sin. And our God gets to do that because he, within himself, is the standard for what is right. But also, it's important to understand that to know God as just is to know God stands as judge over all. Adam and Eve were judged by God. They were removed from the garden. God has the right and he alone has the right to remove us from his presence because of our sin. And it's a pretty terrifying reality to understand that one day all people, all humans will stand before a just God and we will do it alone. We will stand before a just judge and he will determine whether we are in the right or whether we are unjust, whether we are in the right or whether we are sinners. He will get to determine that and he alone. That's why the psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. What's this, what's this psalmist saying? He's saying that our God is just. He knows what is right. He does what is right. But in this context, his righteousness is his justice put into action, i.e. his judgment. Meaning that because our God is the standard of what is right and wrong, our God gets to determine whether we're in the right or we're in the wrong. And he will do that. on the last day when you and you alone will stand before a holy, just God. And this is frightening because we break God's just laws all the time and we know that we are not in the right. We know that we have not acted and thought justly at every moment of every day. And we know that because our God is just, he cannot simply sweep sin and rebellion and iniquity under the rug. Because our God is just, he must deal with our sin. And that's a terrifying reality, but... There's a glimmer of goodness here too. Because though it is true that God's justice demands that every sin that we've ever committed will be dealt with, it also means that God's justice demands that every sin and wrong that's ever been committed against us will also be dealt with. The fact that God is just gives us assurance that every sin and abuse and wrong and evil in the world will one day be held accountable. We rightly shriek to think about the lives lost in the Oklahoma City bombings or to think about the lives lost and the families devastated at 9-11. We gasp rightly at the thought and the understanding of thousands of Jews being led to the slaughter in gas chambers. Like we rightly get angered at the slaughtering of millions and millions and millions of preborn children. Like we rightly rage over the senseless murder of school children in Texas and Buffalo and beyond. 
We rightly weep for those who have been abused, even in the context of a church where they ought to be safe, being abused sexually and physically and mentally. But the Bible says that though there are all manners of evil and wrongdoing and there are all manners of wickedness, our God is just and every evil deed, every wrong deed, every abuse, every murder will be brought to its proper consequence because our God is just. We need not be lost in utter despair. Paul writes it this way in Romans 12, 19. The Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And though that's terrifying as an individual to know that I will stand before a just God, there is also a sense of vindication knowing that every evil deed will be dealt with. That no abuse will be ignored by God. That no Acts on innocent people will be ignored by God. Nothing will be swept under the rug. Every single sin will be brought to its proper consequence. God is the one who determines right from wrong. And he will stand as judge over all. He will determine whether we are in the right or whether we are in the wrong. So how can anyone, how can anyone stand in front? Of before in the presence of a perfectly just God. I think the ancient hymn writer puts it best. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. The Bible makes it crystal clear that not a single one of us have any hope to stand before a just God on the day of judgment because we are sinners. We are morally corrupt. We have no hope to stand before a just God on the day of judgment except that we hide ourselves in Christ. That's why the third thing I want you to see is that to know God is just is to know that God declares sinners righteous. Or you could say to know that God justifies sinners through faith in Jesus. The Bible makes it clear. We have no hope. Our God is the standard. He is morally perfect. He is morally excellent. And we will stand before him as a holy God. And we have no hope because he is just and we are wicked. We have no hope. Have y'all ever had that dream that you had to give like a lecture or stand before a large group of people and you didn't have no clothes on? Am I the only one that said that? Okay. I guess I'm the weirdo. All right. You hear about this in the movies, right? Like, ah, oh, I had this weird dream and I had to give a lecture and have any clothes on. It's terrifying. Do you know that the Bible actually describes judgment that way? One day... You, by yourself, not with your spouse, not with your grandmama, not with your children, you by yourself will stand before a just God. And on that day, there are two options. You will either stand before him naked with nothing that you can bring to him other than your sin and your guilt and your shame. And on that day, a just God will not let you go unpunished. Because he is just, you will receive the consequences for your sin that you deserve for eternity. Your only hope is that on that day you enter into the judgment room of God clothed, not in your own righteous deeds, not in your own goodness, but clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And those who entered the judgment room of God on that day clothed in the righteousness of Christ will be declared righteous, not because of what we've done, not because of anything we've done, not because of anything we've earned, not because of any goodness in us, but simply Simply because we have been covered from head to foot in the right standing of Jesus. That's our one and only hope. God is just, we are not. How can we come before him if we are clothed in the righteousness, the justice of Jesus? Many of us grew up in church and as a young kid, you were taught the Romans road so you could share the good news with your friends. The Romans road often begins with Romans 3.23. We jump right into the sin for some reason. We never tell them about God before that. But regardless, Romans 3.23, this says, For all of sin have fallen short of the glory of God. But have you ever looked at that verse in context? 
because the entire context of this text is about the justice of God. This is what is written in Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, or we could say this was to show God's justice because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness or to show his justice at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ Jesus. Let me just be clear about what Paul's saying here. Our God is just. He determines right from wrong. We are not just. We are sinners. Our only hope is to stand before a holy God covered in Christ. But we're sinners. How does that happen? Well, the Bible says that God sent forth his son, Jesus, to die to show forth his justice. Justice. Is it true that in the cross we see the love of God? Absolutely. Is it true that on the cross we see the grace and mercy of God? Absolutely. Is it true though that on the cross we see the justice of God? And the answer is yes. For God to be just, sins must be dealt with. Yet God in his grace and mercy also is the justifier. And how can he be that? By God himself becoming a man to take his own wrath that we deserve because of our sins upon himself in our place so that now the wrath we deserve has been absorbed by another in our place and we get to be declared innocent, righteous, justified in the sight of a just God. You either didn't hear me or you or, or I, I just don't even know. Seriously, that's the best news you've heard. That our God justifies us not on the basis of what we've done or haven't done, but on the basis of what Christ has done for us. He came from heaven as our propitiation, as our sin bearer, as our wrath bearer for us to uphold God's justice. Sin had to be dealt with. Couldn't just be swept under the rug. God's not just. He's not doing the right thing if he lets the guilty go unpunished. But how does he deal with sin in a way that we still have hope? The Son of God comes down and upholds the justice of God by bearing God's just judgment in our place. That's the good news of the gospel. God sent his son Jesus to show us his justice. I love to read old dead theologians. I've already established and I'm different. I had dreams about preaching in front of naked people. So (laughs) reading dead theologians, not that big of a deal. Herman Bovink said this. He's talking about the distinction between saints and sinners. And when he's talking about saints, he's not talking about in the Roman Catholic sense. He's talking about the sense that all of us who put faith in Jesus Christ have been declared holy on the basis of Christ. We've been made saints. This is what Bovink says. Saints are also sinners. And they're actually no better than other sinners. But while the ungodly cover up their sins or gloss over them. True saints acknowledge their sins, confess their sins, and toss themselves on the mercy of Christ. This is the only distinction between saints and sinners. What's Bob Inc. saying? He's saying that as a Christian, you're still a sinner. You're still messed up. I am more messed up than you will ever know. Just ask my wife and kids. Like, I got issues. You've got issues. Do you know the only difference between me and a sinner who's not a Christian is that I've acknowledged that I'm a sinner, that I've confessed my sins, and I've cast myself on the mercy of Christ. That's the only difference. Now, is it true that the spirit inside of me is helping me begin to be convicted of my sin and say no to sin? Absolutely. But I'm no better than the worst sinner you know, but by Christ. But through Christ, we talk about ourselves in such a pharisaical manner in the church. Like we're better than everybody else. That's ridiculous. We put on our suits and ties, which are nice. If you're wearing a suit and tie, you look great. 
we put on our suits and ties and we stand up and we give our offering envelope money and we sing the songs and we're good little boys and girls and we go to vacation Bible school and sense of fuse and missing trips and all these things and we think we're better than somebody. Hear it from me first. You nor I are any better than anybody else. We are morally bankrupt. We have no hope. I don't care who you voted for. You have no hope. You will stand before a just God condemned rightfully because of your sin. Yet Christ comes and he absorbs the wrath that we deserve so that he can justify us and we can be declared righteous, not on the basis of what we've done, but on the basis of what Christ has done for us. So though I got one more point, I just need to take a break for a second. If you have never cast yourself in the mercy of Christ, you don't have to wait for the end. You don't have to wait for that final song. Like you don't have to wait to pray a prayer after me. None of that makes you a Christian. Here's what makes you a Christian. That right now in your heart, you cry out, God, I know I stand before you, guilty sinner, but I am casting myself in the mercy of Christ to take the judgment I deserve in my place. Once you do that now, once you cast yourself in the mercy of Christ now and receive the decoration righteous now because of what he's done, because one day you will stand before a just God. Will you stand naked? Because you had nothing to offer him except for your sin. Or will you stand before him clothed in the righteousness, the goodness of who Christ is and what he's done for you? But lastly, to know God as just is to know that God demands biblical justice. I know that in the past few years term social justice has been thrown out so much within the church and on the news that people are sick of it and they don't even know if they're for it or against it. I have opinions about these things, but I have no authority to talk to you about my opinions. I only have the authority to, to, to serve up for you what the Bible says. So what does the Bible say about justice? Well, there's, there's a lot of places in the Bible that we could go, but probably the clearest place is Micah chapter 6 verse 8. In which we're told in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. God has told you what is good, what pleases him. And what does the Lord require of you? Notice, it doesn't say what he asks of you, what he would like of you, what he gives you as an option. He used requirement language. Do justice. Love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Notice here, it doesn't say anything about tweet about justice, post justice on Facebook. It doesn't say anything about talking about justice all the time. It doesn't say anything about wearing a justice t-shirt. It says to actually do justice. If you are a Christian, you have been empowered by God's spirit to look like Christ. And one of Christ's attributes is that he is just. This is an attribute that we can participate in, which means you, through God's word, need to know what's right and do what's right. This is why we as Christians, we do justice. We speak up for the preborn. This is why we cannot turn a blind eye to racism. This is why we step up to foster and adopt children who have been abandoned. This is why we care for widows. This is why we walk in when everybody else walks out because the Bible says our God is the standard for right and wrong and he will judge all on the basis of his standard. Yet he offers justification. He offers being declared righteous through what Christ has done for you. And then he will empower you by his spirit to begin to look like Christ and to love and know and do what is right just like Christ did. I know that... We often would like to know specifically, okay, well, if I'm a Christian, how should I vote? Or what should I think about this issue or that issue? And it's not always going to be crystal clear. But what we know is that as Christians, we don't get the option to not care about injustices in our society. As a Christian, we don't get the option to stay silent when people are being abused and hurt and attacked in our nation. As a Christian, we must walk in and seek to do justice because that's what Christ requires of those who claim the name of Jesus. 
So on that day, when you stand before a just God, will you stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Christ? And if so, how are you living out that righteousness to the way that you do justice? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have made yourself known to us. And we thank you that you have made yourself known as a just God. The God who is the standard for what is right and wrong. We acknowledge that you were the rightful judge over all. And so I pray that every single person in this room who has not yet bowed the knee to King Jesus in this moment, I pray that they would cast themselves on the mercy of Christ, that they would acknowledge their sin, that they would acknowledge that they stand before you, a just God guilty. And in this moment, that they would cry out to you for salvation and become clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Those that already are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, I pray that we, empowered by your spirit, through your word, we would begin to do justice. That we would speak up for the unborn. That we, would, that we would speak out and seek to counteract racism. That we would seek to live lives that glorify you by pursuing and doing justice. Not according to social standards. Not according to the news. But according to your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In just a minute, we'll have pastors available to talk with you and pray with you. But, but every time the Bible is preached, you and I have a response to make. You don't get to think, oh, well, somebody else around me, they, they need to respond. No, you need to respond. If you've heard God's word, we all have a response to make. So the way that we do that is through singing, worshiping Jesus, through praying and asking God, God, what, what in my life needs to change in response to what I've heard? So this time is designed for that. So let's stand to our feet, let's sing, and let's pray. Holy God, love became perfect man to bear my blame. On the cross he took my sin. So thankful that you are here today. Guests, please don't forget on your way out to go back and to the back. There'll be there people there to greet you and to answer any questions you have, but also to give you a gift. For those of you that would like to talk to the pastor about how to be justified, how to, how to cast yourself in the mercy of Christ. Maybe you want to be baptized, join our church, or maybe you just need prayer and encouragement. Keith's available, John's available. They're not rushing out. Uh, we're here to help and to serve you. But today, we do have the opportunity to to commission a crew of folks that are leaving this Saturday for Puerto Rico. And so if you're a part of that trip, if you want to make your way down front, uh, so encouraged uh, that under the leadership of our student pastor, Justin Hall, we have put forth a missions pathway, which means every one of our students, seventh grade through 12th grade, have the opportunity to spend a week of their lives on mission. And so by the end of their senior year, those who began with us in seventh grade will have the opportunity to go on six mission trips, which is incredible. And the group that we have in front of us is a group of 13 seniors, recent high school graduates that are leaving on Saturday to go to Puerto Rico. Now, in just a couple of weeks, some of these folks are starting full-time jobs. Some of them are moving to Alabama, Auburn, Troy, elsewhere. And yet they're giving up one of their final weeks of their last summer to serve Christ. Some of you, you read too much Fox News and they're worried about all kinds of things. Let me tell you, the church and the mission of Christ is in good hands with the next generation. So super, super excited. Super excited. 
We're going to commission them, and as we pray for them, we're also going to pray right now. We've got people in Honduras. We've got people in Scotland. We're about to have people in Puerto Rico. I'm thankful to be a part of a great commission church that doesn't just think about ourselves and if our Sunday school rooms got air conditioning or not, but we're thinking about getting the gospel to the ends of the earth, all right? So let's extend our hands, and let's pray for these folks, and let's commission them in the name of Christ. Lord God, we thank you. That out of your goodness, you have sent forth your son, Jesus, to die in our place so that we can be justified. And now by your spirit through the word, you commission us and send us out to declare the message of Christ to the ends of the earth. I thank you for these recent high school graduates who are willing to give up a week of their time to go and to preach the gospel amongst the people in Puerto Rico. I pray that you would grant them safe travels. I pray that there would be no issues with their flights. And God, more than anything, I pray that you would grant them boldness, that they would share the gospel with people on the plane, that they would share the gospel with people in the airport, that they would share the gospel in Puerto Rico, that they would encourage Christians there. Lord, I pray that you would use this week in their lives to impact them, to give them a vision for the rest of their lives, serving Christ in the local church for the cause of getting the gospel to the ends of the earth. We also pray for those that are in Honduras and Scotland. We pray that you would continue to grant them safety, use them to declare the gospel, and to love people in those countries. We pray this, and we commission this team in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let's be reminded that we are a great commission people. And seniors, you can help me. Let's lead out and let's recite. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray for all of our folks that are living on mission this week, but let's take the opportunity for us to declare the good news of Christ to our neighbors and coworkers and friends all around us.